Good evening and welcome to the Freddie Schiff Levin Lecture Series, which is generously sponsored by the Levin family. Now in its 19th season, this lecture honors the artist Freddie Schiff Levin, her legacy as a member of the Provincetown Arts Community by inviting artists, curators, authors, and scholars to speak at PAM every year. We're grateful to the Levin family for their continued support of this program and being able to bring in great folks, not only to talk about the exhibitions that are up on the walls, but also books and, and projects and such. And we're really thankful, and Tony's here with us tonight, so thank you, Tony, for continuing this for us. Um, we're very lucky tonight. We have a really uh, dynamic duo here. Um, this exhibition, Zara Khan, Your Everyday Myths, has been hugely and wildly successful this summer. Um, when Megan proposed the show, I don't know, like 900 years ago, before <laughs> yeah. the pandemic, it made a lot of sense. Um, Zara has, has been in Provincetown, uh, we were what, here for 10 years? Through the Fine Arts, the Mass College of Arts Low Residency Program through the Fine Arts Work Center, which had an exhibition at the Provincetown Art Association Museum. How's that, right? Did I get them all? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm especially grateful to these two. They did everything. Like, it was one of those things where, the show just appeared and it was, you know, it was easy to pack, you know, if you know how to fold a sheet, right? <laughs> Which I still don't know how to do. Oh. But anyway, yeah. I, I'm really grateful to both of you for, for, for putting this together. It's really been a wonderful experience to interact not only with the videos, but with the artwork. And I am, I'm loving it. I, every time I come in here, I see something different that I didn't see before. And I'm, again, I'm excited for you all to hear their story. So with that, I'm going to introduce Megan Hinton, our curator, who is going to introduce our artist, Zara Khan. And before we do that, I just want to let you know that our next lecture is September 1st at 6 o'clock, which is going to be um, Michelle Law, Midge Patel, Rebecca Bruin, and Amy Heller discussing their exhibition, Out of the Blue, which is a cyanotype exhibition that will be actually up um, later this year. So thank you all, and with that, Megan, all you. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, I, I want to thank Leslie for putting these lecture series together. It's always good to, ha to have some conversation and delivery of putting the art in context. Um, and I want to thank Chris McCarthy because she had the foresight to know that this show should be in this big space to show Zara's breadth and also to give Zara a show in high summer season. For that, we are very grateful for that kind of visibility. Um, the sh like Chris said, I think the show was proposed over six years ago, so it's wonderful to see this realization. Um, and I think it's a highlight of this Provincetown summer of 2022. I want to thank Seth Abramson, former registrar and new registrar, Madeline Larson for organization, and always Jim Zimmerman for his amazing installation and hanging skills. Um, I'll speak very briefly about Zara's work, which will be followed by her slide talk, and then we'll open to a Q&A. So just make a mental note, hold your questioning for the Q&A period. Thank you, and thank you for coming. Your Everyday Miss was a seamless curation for me, from initial communication to final hanging, as Zara's vision was clear and decisive, much like her work. Zara Khan's multidisciplinary work is under the influence of medieval illuminated manuscripts, the divided mark or divisionism of impressionism and its keyed up color, graffiti, notably Keith Haring's unabashed use of the continuous line to create rhythm and flow, and the pattern and design art movement from the 1970s and 80s, where a group of predominantly women artists began to defy notions of male-dominated Western approaches to art making. P and D, pattern and design as it's called, use patterning and sewing as a form of high art influenced by art from Asia and Africa. The term femage came from the P and D movement where women's craft, sewing, and painting merge. In Zara's work, like P and D, Often, a non-specific aspect of composition occurs with an edge-to-edge -edge coverage seen here in such works as Charm Quilt, Invisible, and the performance documentation on the monitor 
indoor light making. Zara's work, work is rooted in painting, but she approaches it with the spirit of applied arts where multiple media merge to create humorous, playful, and psychologically charged performance, sculpture, and flat work. We see further influence from her own Pakistani heritage with the contemporary appropriation of Islamic geometry and mark making that she describes as a holiness through patterning, as the um, referencing arabesque decor or patterns that might decorate a Persian carpet. Or in Zara's case, motifs on a bed sheet or comforter, which project the surface's original object use value into a new function of poetic painterly sculpt and poetic painterly and sculptural musings. Islamic art, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, virtually defies any comprehensive definition apropos to the inability to materially categorize Zara Khan's oof. Your everyday miss defies traditional notions of art making. Zara's non-tentative openness through process and material leads to an experimentation, a lowbrow materiality of markers, hot glue, papier-mâché, and scraps of recycled notes with torn up drawings brings forth contemporary hybrid constructions. She subverts the notion of using expensive, financially inaccessible art supplies to figure out how art can be made with trash, office supplies, or adhesives typically used to join two substrates, substrates now existing here on a pedestal in an opulent display. The bed sheets and comforters whose surfaces are marked in meditative totality can be conveniently folded and tucked away, an ingenious solution Khan uses to solve the burden of material storage for artists. The sheets are foldable and portable. She paints them one area at a time on her lap, typically sitting on the floor. The physicality is, a gr is grounding herself in the work with a casual, playful nature to find her subject during a process-driven trip. Works in hot glue like Golden Culprit and Diatom make the gooey, stringy medium <laughs> a glowing translucent substrate for painting and sculpture. They hang an exhibition from, ceiling to to from the ceiling to reframe and look through on both sides, putting works in a broader layered context. They're at play with the flat field of two-dimensional art while simultaneously accentuating space and dimension. On closer inspection, paper mache animals perch on wires and sit on the floor in their real-time actual positions, as if up in the sky or next to the bed. Pieces like Fancy Golden Cat Sitting or Seersucker Cat display an adorned anthropomorphic informalism to delight, challenge, and surprise us viewers. Congratulations, Zara, on your show. We are so lucky to have it here in Provincetown and at PAM. I'd like to introduce you to Zara Khan. Please give her a warm welcome. Well, thank you all so much for coming. And uh, no, it's okay. I can I can point this right through you. Um, I thought I'd introduce a little bit about who I am and where I came from. And um, you know, I'd love to answer any questions you have at the end. Um, so I wanted to. This is me. I wanted to show me uh, the original me, which is loving food and uh, with gusto. I was born in '83 in Indonesia. Um, neither of my parents are Indonesian, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then I moved to Paris for seven years, which is where that picture was taken. Um, Switzerland for three years, and then moved to Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, right in time for middle school and high school. So, my father's from Karachi, Pakistan. My mother's from Idaho. Um, they met in India, uh, and that's kind of why they have such a... Uh, through their work as, in architecture and as a diplomat, um, they moved us and exposed us to the entire world, which was... Um, 
My sister likes to call herself an ethnic mutt. Um, you know, I can relate to that. Um, and of course, this is our cat, Shere Khan. Very, you know, cats play very important roles in my life, so here we are, the first original cat. Um, quilt making and textile embroidery um, has been long part of my Idaho side of the family. Um, and this was a quilt that my great great grandmother made um, in Idaho. Uh, and I grew up with these on my bed, and I could tell the love and specificity, the time commitment that I don't, I don't know what she looks like, but I have her quilt. Um, so there was something really special that was happening with um, owning something that's like a little piece of history. Um, so at some point I decided I wanted to try to make my own version of quilt making, but without the patience that a real quilter or that a fabric quilter requires and the specificity with lines. Um, I am not into straight lines at all. Uh, they don't make me happy, so I'm not going to do them. Um, so this was my version, which was um, instead of cutting out scraps of fabric, I'm cutting out uh, scraps of paper from throughout my whole life. So diary entries, uh, postcard, exhibition postcards, any sort of little piece of paper that becomes precious and um, they're like little treasures and you're not sure what to do with them. I kind of want to honor them by giving them a new life. Uh, like they get to continue on. Uh, I don't need to keep every scrap of paper I did in my childhood. I can just put it in this. <laughs> <laughs> a little close-up. Um, homework, uh, drawings, things that didn't quite work out and you're never quite sure what to do with them. I'm always cannibalizing my uh, own work and resources. I'm a scrounger at heart. And um, what Megan, I, at the beginning of this, when we were trying to figure out the title for the show, I was thinking trash art. You know, it's kind of <laughs> part of what I love about it, because it's a little snarky and a little irreverent, and you're not really supposed to be playing with trash. Um, <laughs> which is why I want to do it. This is a, a process shot. Um, hot glue changed my entire <laughs> <laughs> So because, um, uh, you know, you can see this is crafting hot glue, just, just you get at the crafting store, but the bond is immediate. Which means you can burn yourself very severely, or you can um, bond paper very quickly. So I started um, really becoming in love with the process um, that was supposed to be kind of this huge, elaborate um, monument to sewing um, that I get to just kind of irreverently play with. Um, here is the back side. You can kind of see it was just more of a limited palette of larger pieces of drawings, chunks of drawings. Um, and this is uh, the Oh Shit Quilt, <laughs> named because I'm, I'm like pointing out a little square in the middle here. This is the first. Um, shape I did, and I cut out the words, oh shit, and I realized that, oh shit, there's no way I'm going to be able to continue doing this. They're tiny, um, very laborious, and so I was like, well, that's the name of the whole damn thing. You're definitely not supposed to be swearing in the art of quilt making, I'm pretty sure. Um, it goes against kind of those ideas of femininity and, uh, you know, crap, female handiwork, you're not really supposed to be swearing like a swe sailor while you do it, um, which is why I do it. Uh, this is the backside. Um, a lot of costuming um, for performances. You can tell this repetitive mark that I'm really interested in. These were fox costumes, um, and that was kind of like the main pattern that's being played with here. Close up. Um, I also thought it was really funny to put it, attach it together with staples, <laughs> which is well, it's not the most easy thing to do, but I also do a lot of things in the name of humor. 
And that, that's like a little drawing I did when I was, you know, five. A little snowman. Um, an interesting part of this, putting together this show, which has been in the works for a while, is realizing that some pieces just kind of pick, represented a time for me. And this was 2000 when Grab by the Pussy was in the news every damn day. And um, I was trying to like, figure out how I, what I thought about, uh, you know, this the cats, the femininity, um, chaos, uh, working with all of those. And uh, cats in question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see the pussy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it's, it's there. Uh, oops, sorry. And that's the back side. Um, I realized. I have, I'm very interested in space, in outer space, uh, NASA images of nebulas, and um, I, I kind of borrow a lot of colors from that, I realize, and a lot of these swirling motions that are in my work, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm just trying to create a notion of time and space just swirling and changing around us at all times. Um, here's the piece invisible, which is not invisible. Uh, also created of uh, costuming that was paintings on Long John's. <laughs> and I started this piece in Provincetown as kind of like a, a, an idol, like a, some, something to uh, look for, for fortune, good fortune, which is, um, I, I put all these symbols of kind of good fortune and my circumstance in this piece, which is, you know, here we are at the beach, and um, there's a compass that is pointed backwards with a magnet kind of affecting the compass. Um, bees, because Lord knows they're very important right now. Um, the hand symbols are kind of, um, they were actually Roman gestures, Roman hand, hand symbols, so they're not sign language, but I love that people could see any of that in there. Uh, or a combination. Um, and then from the corner is coins falling from the heavens, um, a big stack of dollars, a big fat bag of money. And um, here's a little wreath, kind of thinking about uh, championing the mind, you know, like intellectualism. Uh, oh, oh, right. And of course, there's got to be a cat in there. Um, because it's I want to break the tension a little bit, maybe make it a little less serious. Um, and I love cats. Let's keep going. Holding a lobster? You know, some people have said that. Yes, that, that, is, um, that is supposed to be one of those cartoonish um, magnets. Um, but it is very crustacean-y as well. Yeah. Um, now this piece, which is called Ecstatic, um, I named it because it reminded me of a Bernini um, sculpture where it's uh, Mother Mary's holding Jesus and there's all these crazy right, light rays coming out of it and he, the sculptor has done the light rays and these huge rods. So I love this idea of kind of explosion and light and how do you show that? Um, which is where the uh, installing arrows around it, I kind of just wanted to force that um, weird energy that's coming out of his hand um, into the space. Um, and it's also a little bit of a nod to some more art historical heroes of mine. There's an um, Albrecht Dürer character back here um, from Adam and Eve. This is Adam. Um, and at a certain point I drew him and I didn't like his proportions and I thought, I'm not really into men either. I'm just gonna take him right out right now. <laughs> Um, so he's kind of covered with this ecstasy of, flor uh, of flowers, which was a collage. So I loved the idea of like, um, well, which is another Botticelli reference uh, from, from the Venus character, is Botticelli's always doing these characters barfing out flowers <laughs> in ecstasy, as if like it, it's, you know, and I loved that idea of um, we're so flower, like, can we be floral in kind of like a, 
as an entity, almost. Um, and then down below is a little reference to um, Lily, Monet lily pad and a Van Gogh um, vase of flowers. And then, of course, a cat that is saying meow, meow, meow. And then backwards, it's meow, 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 meow. <laughs> Um, and part of the reason why I'm writing backwards is because I'm drawing on both sides of the sheet at the same time, which creates the ink uh, seepage uh, affects one side, well, affects both sides at the same time. Um, so this piece is Fox Thoughts. It started out with a lot of actual um, writing. Uh, it's, it's been mostly obscured now. Um, but almost like these foxes were having these little bucolic floral thoughts about love. Um, and I wanted to lean into the floral over, I mean, this, this bed sheet is crazy, like uh, with this great border here, this floral border, and I left the sign on that says it's a full sheet that's a, a dollar. <laughs> I did pay a dollar for it. Um, and I like keeping that little, uh, interruption inside the piece. Uh, here's the piece that's behind us, the rat quilt, which I started in 2004. Um, very, it was a very sparse drawing, and then it just got more and more developed throughout the years, um, as I realized that there was more that could be done to it. Um, I'd like to think that I wouldn't beat a piece to death, but I might. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't take it away from me, I might. Um, and this is, uh, you know, as Megan was saying, my anthropomorphic characters about um, love and emotions. These are all little relationships going on, um, swirling in the cosmos of Provincetown. Uh, there's the little, the Pilgrim Monument in the corner, um, and just kind of an, a frenzy or an ecstasy of um, excesses. Donuts, cake, uh, pie, uh, booze, cigarettes. Uh, well, here's some books. I don't know. I, I like books too. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of show chaos um, and yeah, almost like universal chaos in a specific context. Um, this piece, uh, at one point I called it unfitted because it's a fitted bed sheet that I ripped up the sides and then painted on both sides. Um, and in much of the way that I like to reuse my work, I repurposed this piece for a performance where I wore the, the sheet and walked around the grounds and there, of, of this beautiful space and made a, an artist boat me around, um, which was very fun. Uh, but part of it, I mean, then it became, is it a hijab? Is it a reference to, um, you know, my Pakistani culture? Do people in other areas of the world wear this? Are, should they be wearing it in Western upstate New York? You know, it's, I'm kind of playing with all those questions. Um, and at a certain point, I started making the marks on people and myself, um, which was probably my first foray into three dimensions and was very confusing at the time. But I knew I wanted to make fun or like poke fun at mark making in a different way. Um, so that came through photography and film. And as another kind of performance that I really found encapsulated where I was in my life at the time, um, this performance was in February 2021. Uh, so it was right at the beginning of kind of like shut down Zoom culture as well. Everybody was like, oh my gosh, we're gonna have to talk to our parents on Zoom. How do we do this? Um, so this was my first Zoom performance. Uh, where I painted myself and I thought in this pandemic I just wanted to be in a nest of painting, like home. I wanted to feel like I was in bed at home. Um, so I called it indoor light painting. It's almost like I'm trying to paint 
just my little domestic scene. Um, and I found that, oh, I also scored it to Enya, because um, I was trying to think of what was the most stereotypical relaxing music you could pick, <laughs> while it also being kind of fun and recognizable. And I mean, it definitely kind of added a surreal whimsy to this moment. A little retro as well, because um, that, that song was a very popular song in the 90s. Correct. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually looking into the, the zoom lens, trying to see my painting. Um, so I found there were some interesting things about where I was looking and maybe who the audience was starting to become um, through this performance. Um, this is a piece I created for another performance. Actually, um, there is a film that I've included in the show of uh, rabbits in, or people dressed up as rabbits in the snow in Vermont. And um, at the time in Vermont, I, I was thinking of spring. So spring in Vermont, let's jump in the snow. You know, laundry day in Vermont, let's be naked in the snow. <laughs> like, I just wanted to crank up the absurdity of it. And um, so this was kind of a celebration of spring. And it was as a bed sheet, I brought it along for the installation of this show and realized that it could uh, become involved very quickly. Uh, in one fell swoop, it became a ghost. And all I had to do was cut some uh, eye holes out of it. And it became part of a permanent piece of artwork that is in this gallery of uh, Charles Webster Hawthorne, who is a, you know, amazing character in Provincetown history. And I kind of like that I got to sneak him into the show <laughs> in this roundabout way um, while it's like drawing attention to him, but also obscuring him. So, and I have heard some interesting comments about how it, again, looked like a borka to some people. And for me, it was totally, I was thinking, ooh, spooky ghost, you know? Um, but there can't help but be, um, you know, some visual similarities, for sure. And, um, and right, so this is the, the Bunny Laundry Day uh, piece, where I collaborated with a friend who, is, who did sew that quilt together. Um, and then she created an effect, like a green screen, where you replace certain colors of the quilt with a projection, um, which was technology that she knew how to use and introduce to me. And so we thought, well, what is the, the image that should be playing across this uh, spring laundry scene? And so we figured some floral uh, decorated breasts would be like the bountiful spring. Uh, <clears throat> and speaking of breasts, this piece is called One Boob. Um, <laughs> and when I put this up, I realized it's signed, you know, 2018, and then I'm like, oh crap, it's actually 2022, you know, like, so I'm, I'm constantly reworking things, evolving them, and then realizing, oh, it looks like a boob. I got it, you know, now that it has the title to it it becomes something else and becomes part of this show, um, which I was, oops, sorry. Um, and there is a pigeon made out of trash found in my studio in Nepal. Um, I love doing art residencies and traveling as much as possible. So I was in Nepal for a one month art residency recently, actually during the pandemic, which was crazy because I, I feel like I was actually there with no tourists, which is probably never gonna happen again. Um, and I didn't realize what a visual difference. And I mean, again, like there's no, there's no pollution in the city because everybody was gone. I mean, it, is, it was an amazing time to be there for sure. Um, and pigeons are kind of sacred there. They, they feed them outside the temples. Um, so I loved this, this everyday creature that has a little bit of sacredness to it, um, which I feel kind of like most creatures do. Um, 
And here's seersucker cat. Uh, my girlfriend at the time cut off her pants. She had seersucker pants. She made them into shorts. And so all the rest of the seersucker material went into the cat. And then um, paper mache. Uh, and I love anything that looks like fake gold. So I became really interested in um, if gold is so precious, fake gold, if it's beautiful, then where does the preciousness come in? Um, some uh, decorated wine bottles and beer bottle. Um, I, again, um, a lot of my aesthetic choices are made off of uh, kind of jokes that I make to myself. So I like that this is a real beer bottle that's covered in paper, and then this one is an empty paper bottle with nothing inside. So I'm just kind of playing games on materials. Um, that's an egg that was covered in hot glue dots and then painted blue. And I just loved that all of a sudden it was transformed into this bizarre uh, texture quickly. Um, this is a leaf, a, a bowl made out of rose leaves um, glued together. And there was something about the, oh, well, this is a process shot. So I, I do these pieces on the back of a baking sheet so I can peel them off very easily. And then I flip it over and work on it on both sides, which creates, so there's not just one side that's completely flat and one side that's kind of more um, in relief. So I just, I'm flipping it all the time, which is actually how I do the, the bed sheets pieces too. I'm interested in um, what happens with both surfaces. Um, that is just a hot glue piece with no paint on it. Um, but then I became interested in dangling painted parts. I, I mean, they, they feel... Hmm. Well, this piece is called Diatom Quilt. Another interest in kind of atomic level uh, breaking things down. Another one that I kind of think of as a constellation or an orbit. This is my fake bronze stage. Um, I mean, it's almost got religious connotations of um, uh, chalices. So uh, definitely playing with a lot of religious symbols. Oh, and it, it's candy that's mixed in as the jewels. Another hot glue piece, not in this show, but uh, just figured I would show a little bit more of what I've been working on, mainly during this pandemic time. Um, <clears throat> hot glue piece with a card that I thought was very special. Yeah. Ah. Uh, the golden culprit. And um, I just wanted to end it with this picture from a uh, film that Amy Davies made for us at Pam, uh, interviewed us out in the woods. And because we, we were trying to avoid the construction noises here at Pam, we, she had this beautiful spot in the woods for us to do. And I said, well, could we sit right into the, in the moss, you know, so we really get the color of the, the green in there. Um, so I'm always looking for color. And I got to say thank you so much to Pam for having me. And Provincetown is such a special place in my heart. I feel it's a, a homecoming. And um, I'm just, I feel very grateful to be here. So thank you for having me. <laughs>
to Zara, the exhibition. Please, by all means, they're welcome. Please. Um, in making art, making drawing, uh, I often think about how the first mark and the last mark are the most difficult. And I was going to ask you a question and you referenced it yourself about, you know, uh, what it that I can overdo or I can chill. Or, uh, I wonder, how do you know when it's done? I mean, how is it ever done? Yeah, um, I do find a point where it is done. Um, like I definitely could never go back into this Fox piece. This one, you might see me go back into this later. We'll see. Somebody better take it off my hands. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just a big believer in like uh, no mistakes either. So if, if the first mark is a mistake, that's fine. Um, it just means that maybe I need to cut a hole out in the middle of this piece or fuse it or collage it or change it completely. It just means it's going to reorient things. Yeah. Do you um, work on one piece at a time or do you go over here and then go over there? How do you, how do you get through all of those things? Some are Yes, um, and I think a lot of artists go through the struggle is that it is very physically demanding. Um, even these tiny little marks. Um, so I do work on multiple projects at the same time, usually in different parts of my apartment. So then um, when I feel like sitting down and relaxing, you know, I have a big piece that I can put on my lap and just maybe listen to the radio or TV and kind of zone out into meditation. And then I try to have pieces that I, I really need my full brain for. Like there's no way I could watch TV for it uh, to, you know, to make more active choices. Um, so yes, because a lot of these pieces involve sitting for so long, I have to break up my day with different projects. Yeah. Stephen. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I was late, so hopefully I didn't ask the question you already said. Oh, um, <laughs> so I love the, the way the hot glue, um, and so to me they look a bit like screens, mm -hmm. and, and one question I have is, how big can they get? Have you experimented with, do they start to break? And that's one question. The second question is, since I think they look a bit like screens, like jolly screens or something, mm -hmm. how do you feel when people kind of load cultural references on your work when you're not actually even working in that space? I'm totally into it. <laughs> yes, I love people mixing up cultural references and putting them in because the truth is, is I'm totally mixed up and I've synthesized a lot um, into these works. Um, okay, what was that first part of your question? Oh, oh. yes. Um, I have gotten them to be, you know, larger, but the truth is, is they do become compromised by weight. Um, and it depends on how I'm showing them. Uh, I have become frustrated when I do larger pieces because that rolling them um, structurally can damage them. And, you know, so like the more precious they become, the harder it is. So there's definitely an engineering part that has to go into it that structurally everything has to be balanced. Mm -hmm. And that was just a learning curve. But with hot glue, there's really no mistakes because you can just cut that right out. Yeah. Please. The piece behind you, the piece behind you uh, is the border cotton, uh, steps of cotton? Yes, the whole thing is cotton. It was a found blanket that somebody um, gave me from the Truro swap shop. They picked it up for me, and I was going camping, and they gave it to me. Um, <clears throat> I can show you that. The backside is a much more minimal drawing. Um, you know, almost washy watercolor. And uh, I did try to hang it to like keep some of the puffiness in, you know, because I, I liked that it had some texture. Thank you. Thank you. And that doesn't, that doesn't bleed through. 
No, this one, I, yeah, it really didn't. Um, just because there's so much cotton batting in it. Yeah. Yeah, the bleed of the material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes that happens. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, I think also we're not seeing the backside, and there's a, a whole other pictorial thing going on in the backside. And I think ultimately that's what these these are flat. These are presented as flat works, but they're really sculptural because you you could interact and walk around them, and some of them are displayed that way especially with the quilts hanging from the wires. And we didn't have a clear direction of how to feature the hot glue pieces until we were laying out the show. And that was just a kind of an aha moment that that would show that three dimensionality, that this thing that's simultaneously flat and dimensional, and that's also making a dimension and a layer to the rest of the exhibition. So, um, I think it's the, the other side of things is something that's, that's, that's very interesting in the work. Thank you. And I forgot to say that um, I am very interested in Turkish screens, which is, um, I saw an amazing Matisse show at the MFA in Boston. And it had, it was, it was the objects that were in the room that he painted. And it included a bunch of, well, I, maybe they were from Morocco, but um, they were screens that were made out of fabric with cut holes in them and geometric designs, um, you know, to, to give you a little shade. And I just loved that idea. And that, that's where the, um, in the pussy quilt, I cut out all these shapes kind of under that influence of um, also realizing that because there were so many colors going on in it, that actually cutting out space might unify the piece um, better because color was already not an option. It was, the colors were too wild. So I love screens. <laughs> I, had a friend, um, years ago, I had a friend years ago who um, made a book out of his sketchbook. Mm. And he drew with markers, so every page had a ghost on the other side. And he also photographed them. And the back of every page was the reverse of what was on the other side. It was brilliant. I mean, it's like you wonder what do you do with this stuff that you weren't doing but was happening, yeah. you know, and how do you record that or how do you celebrate that? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was really wonderful just thinking about your other side comment. Nice. Mm -hmm. I, I have done some drawings that were done both you know, on paper that are both sides like that. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question, really. Sure. Um, I, I love the sort of irreverence of you having this sheet and they're going, yeah, if we cut two holes in it, we can put it over this guy in the corner. You know, mm -hmm. like make this completely unexpected piece of art, um, not what you were planning when you walked in here. And I, I just think that's amazing that you'll just suddenly alter it in a very permanent way. Um, <laughs> because that's what's going to be best for this moment in time in this particular space and show. Mm -hmm. can, can I comment on that? Please. Um, so when we were hanging the show, this was also not planned. And there was a, a sort of little quiet act of performance where Zara's giggling in the corner and putting the <laughs> cheek. <laughs> Over the bus of Charles Hawthorne, our fa founding father of Problem Sound Painting. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think, which is a lovely thing and well represented in, in this museum, but I think we're kind of more in the beginning of this 21st century in conversation about who's in the canon of art, mm -hmm. who's represented. Is it just the white man who's been left out? And, and some by, somehow by She's not going to say this, I don't think. But she's, she's making an act that opens up a lot of thought about what's happening. But I will say that it's also a way of just covering that history for a second <laughs> to maybe talk about what else is going on. And we were a little bit like, can we do this? And we were like, 
Chris, can we do this? And Chris was like, sure, absolutely. And, you know, I think that's one thing about, you know, you make work and then you put in an exhibition and the context of the space affects the final outcome of the show. So that was one of Zara's moves. And of course she was in there like cutting out an eye at the 11th hour and, you know, putting it all in. But um, that was a really nice bonus piece that we got <laughs> unexpected. It's yeah. like he's a parakeet at night. Right, yeah. <laughs> Perchy, yeah. Yeah. Lenny. Yeah. I just had Yeah. I just had a comment. I've been to the show a couple of times and I've been watching Zara's work grow over the years. But I always see something new and that's my comment. I just realized that that piece has a squirrel in it. <laughs> and of course I love squirrels. This one right here? Yeah. Yeah. I just realized that the tail is sort of bending and then I, I thought it was just part of the landscape until so I, my comment is there's always something to see, so keep looking. Yeah, anyway. it's constantly emerging. Yeah, it's true. I did love Where's Waldo pieces when I was a kid. Um, I was curious about, I don't know if you would use these words, but I get this sense in your work that there's this really like, exuberant persistence through a lot of material, what could be a material challenge, which could stop another type of artist. Hmm. Like what you said about there being no mistakes. Right. Um, and I'm curious about where that like exuberant or like joyful persistence or versatility comes from with not, you don't have to get like no, logical, but um, was there a time in your life as a younger artist where you hadn't built that in yet? Or you ha where you hadn't discovered that oh, yet? Oh, was, yeah. What did it take to build that kind of persistence and versatility through material challenge? Um, well, I appreciate that and I do love a challenge um, and that does, uh, motivate me a lot in my work is if I find like a treasure trove of trash, I get real excited and I think, how can I transform this? Um, oh, geez, I just lost what you were. Oh, you said, how, how do you build that, oh. that muscle, that persistence? Gotcha. I think um, what really has helped is travel um, and being exposed to so many types of art making and craft making throughout the world. Um, and I do feel like I've been in a special, I've been given a special position to be able to sneak in and out of different cultures um, because of how I was raised. And um, when I travel, I was taught at a certain point that I should never limit myself in making art by where I am because there's always some sort of output you can make. Um, whether it's drawing in the sand and taking a picture of it or, um, you know, cr trying to transform a small apartment. Um, I, because I work in limited resources, I uh, want to take advantage of the scenarios and the places and the people that want to work with me, too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a few of these sure. uh, show exhibition goer questions. Let's see. Provincetown Venus, could you please explain the significance of the hands in upper left corner and the spelling spelling out a word and spelling out a word. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think because they, they're probably assuming that that is um, uh, sign language and that I am spelling something out. Um, the truth is, is they were, I was taking them from Roman symbols and I can't remember what they mean anymore. Um, which is fine for me because it's, it was the spirit of the thing that was important. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Was the pussy quilt deliberately hung so the green neon of the exit sign would show through the holes, becoming part of the piece. Yes, yes. 
Yes. Well, I mean, Megan and I were trying to figure out how to hang yeah, these was, pieces yeah. with without um, blocking the line of sight of some of the bigger works. I mean, at one point I thought maybe I could have a laundry line going across the entire gallery. Um, but I was afraid that maybe that was gonna interfere with too much, like interfere too much with the space. So when we hung the pussy quilt in the corner, it was, um, it's a bonus that it hides that exit sign and it becomes part of the art. And it's a lovely color green, so. Yeah. I, I, something visually, just that piece worked over there. We kind of had it around mm -hmm. and, and something about the light filtration and the, the openings through the surface. Yeah. So we did consider the exit sign. Um, the Provincetown rat blanket, was this inspired by a particular rat? <laughs> or just rats in general, question mark. Inquiring minds want to know. Shh. I don't this know is a little, is. there's a little drawing of a rat it's with nice. some sort of illegible text near it. Yeah. So that's the question. Yeah, um, this, these are specific rats. Um, and I think actually that's why I was interested, like why this piece has continued throughout the years is because they were specific people, and maybe that that awkwardness and the relationship um, carries through in the drawing and makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, so yeah, I they are to me they were they were all relationships from my past. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Interesting life. Yeah. yeah. Well, love is really weird. So. I, think this, I, I think this is a real Provincetown piece somehow. It seems like Commercial Street at 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, how do you make the stencil, Maeve Taylor, age six? Oh, stencil. How do you make the stencil? Um, I don't know which stencil. I mean, maybe they're talking about the, the shape, the repetitive uh, shapes. Uh, um, I cut one out and then used it as a template and just slapped it on to the, repeating it. And they're not, I didn't care if they were completely accurate or completely the right size. A little bit of wobble room is good for the eye, in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> a couple more. You sure? Um, yep. What was the inspiration behind Bunny Laundry Day, La Pen Laundrette. Uh, how could, how cold was the bunny? Hmm. <laughs> and this is, I think, a really good question. Why a bunny in the, as a launderer? Okay. I'm adding the launderer. Why yeah, a bunny? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, for uh, many years, I was costuming people as rats, and that was my animal of choice. Um, because there is such a, hum a reaction of, of, for humans, either seeing one rat or seeing multiple rats. And also, um, like the psychological effect of that, and that we empathize with them a little bit because they're mammals and um, they're so intelligent. Uh, so rats was my animal, and then, um, as I was kind of expanding, I mean, the Bunny Laundry Day was really a, a celebration of spring in Vermont. So um, it was spring in Vermont, and it was covered in snow. And so I thought I have to go right out in there. Um, and I did a couple projects with these bunny characters, and it was very much about um, the excesses of spring and um, uh, the rites, the other project was called the Rites of Spring. So it was, it was really like ritualistic and um, flowers and offerings and um, bunnies are a pretty good symbol of that kind of fertility. And, uh, and it's also an animal that we're all very familiar with. Yeah. The, the last question is, how do you make art with glue? <laughs> but I think you've kind of already talked about it, unless you want to expand on the hot glue. Um, well, I definitely procedures. leaned into making art with 
just glue because I liked a one word medium. Like I liked the description being glue. Yeah. And then being like, what? Um, so I did do that for, for a lot of pieces. I mean, I, I made pieces out of salt and uh, rose leaves, um, trash. Uh, you know, leaves from different parts of the world. It's, it's because I, I'm finding the meaning in it. Um. I think I, I said it a little bit in the opening thing I read, and I think what's so fascinating is that the hot glue is, a, is, a, is used as a tool, as an adhesive that we don't normally see. You know, it's covered by two objects coming together to adhere. And here, the tool or the, the the vehicle is being used as a medium. So, and in a, in, in a way that I'm kind of mesmerized by, you know, how, how it all comes together. So I think that's something that's really important about the hot glue that Zara's pretty open to with material exploration. So, um, I have a question that I've been wanting to ask you for a while, which is, why the title, Your Everyday Myth? <laughs> um, well, I couldn't do I trash like I should, art. should know the answer. And I couldn't this. do in bed, not, which no, was, you know, at yeah. one point. Um, your Everyday Myth, I think it's because I was, I was trying to figure out what tied all these together, and I, I felt like there were mythic stories about love and um, excess and pleasure. Uh, so I, I, it also, I chose materials that I felt were like elemental or important to me. So, um, and I didn't want it to just be my myths. That's why I put the word your in there because I wanted people to think, well, what's your, what's your idea of a myth or what, what's your story? What's my story? I don't know. Maybe they're all, they're all kind of a mixture of everybody's stories. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>